Madam President. Senator from Utah. Madam President, I ask unanimous consent. The quorum call be suspended. Is there objection? Objection, objection is heard. Senator Reid is on the Senate floor, along with Senators Leahy and Grassley, who are managing the immigration bill for the Democrats and Republicans. A deal announced on the Senate floor today by Senators Hoven and Corker would double the number of Border Patrol agents on the border, build 700 new miles of fencing, and spend more money to deploy high-tech tools, including drones, radar, and seismic monitoring. Uh, the so-called border surge amendment would also set a goal for border officials to either capture or turn back 90 percent of the people they spot trying to cross the border. Earlier today, the Senate rejected an amendment offered by Senator Cornyn that would have put mandatory border security triggers in place before immigrants were given legal status.
More senators are gathering in the chamber as we wait for a senator to speak. On the other side of the Capitol, the House this afternoon failed to pass the farm bill. The vote was 195 to 234. A couple of reporters tweeting about that. John Bresnahan of Politico tweeting, Today's loss on the farm bill is another PR dilemma for Speaker Boehner and House GOP leadership. More than 60 R's voted against. Wow. And Chad Pergram of Fox News tweets, Whip McCarthy says D's delivered half as many votes as they promised on the farm bill.
We've been seeing some members of the Gang of Eight who wrote the Senate's immigration bill on the floor as we wait for a senator to speak, including Senators Bennett and Durbin. Mentioned uh, Senator Grassley, who's the top Republican on the Senate Judiciary Committee. He's managing the bill for the Republicans. Senator Grassley voted against the immigration bill when it was in committee. The National Journal writes that progress was in the air today on the immigration bill. Republican Senators John Hoven and Bob Corker offering a border surge. The Democratic Senator Chuck Schumer described as a breathtaking show of force, and it seemed to have figured out how to attract more Republicans without losing any Democrats. Majority Leader. I ask unanimous consent to call the Columbia term. Without objection. What, Madam Chair, is the pending amendment? The Vitter Amendment 1507 to the Leahy Amendment 1103. I raise a point of order against the Vitter Amendment that's improperly drafted to the Leahy Amendment. Point of order is well taken. Mr. President. The amendment Matt. fails. The Vitter Amendment fails. I think that's it falls. That's what I falls. falls. Yeah. Okay. Madam President, I now ask consent to be a period of debate only until 6:30 this evening, with the time equally divided between the two leaders or the designees, and that I be recognized at 6:30 this evening. Is there objection? Without objection, so ordered. Madam President. Senator from Louisiana. Madam President, I don't know if there's any particular order. I see other colleagues that are on the floor. I am not in a particular rush. I would be happy for them to speak. I would like to speak for five minutes as if in morning business, but I'm open to the... Okay. I thank, um, I thank the senators. I know that the leadership, Senator Leahy and Senator Grassley, are working very hard to negotiate some 
very controversial and serious amendments to the underlying bill, and there have been negotiations going on all day uh, on this immigration bill, and actually, Madam President, for weeks, uh, both in the Judiciary Committee, where 17 members serve, and then here on the House floor, uh, where the rest of us have our really only opportunity to engage and to be part of legislating a bill that is likely to pass. There's no guarantee, but it looks like it's moving in that direction. It's been strengthened as it's gone on, and we've had a very rigorous debate. I've come to the floor now several times only to say this, that there are a series of amendments that are completely uncontested. In other words, there's no opposition to them. And the list is approximately, from what we can tell at this point, you know, potentially around 30 to 35. It could be more, but there are clearly 30 to 35 amendments that have been filed by Republicans, by Democrats. Some of these amendments are co-sponsored, Republican and Democrats. I've submitted uh, by Republicans and Democrats each together. And I have been talking about this for a couple of days because I think we've got to get back to trusting each other and working together across party lines on major bills like this and actually work to pass amendments that nobody objects to. Wouldn't that be amazing? Now, we used to do that routinely by a practice called a manager's amendment. But in the last couple of months or years, everybody is so angry and aggravated at the end of the time that there is no manager's package. So I've decided to start early identifying amendments uh, while the leadership is focused on the more controversial amendments and those that both sides are kind of still arguing about that are significantly meritorious. I've been focused um, on amendments that are very good ideas that, to my knowledge, there is literally no opposition. I want to adjust the list and, and remove from the Landrieu list uh, Collins Amendment 1255. There has been some objection on our side to that. Heller 1234. There's been some objection to that. Now, this is not a final. I'm not managing the bill, but I'm just saying to be honest, we've heard some objections from these two. But I want to say that there are additional amendments that come to our attention that may not have any opposition that I may want to add to this list. One of them is Toomey 1236, clarifies that personnel infrastructure and technology used in the comprehensive border security strategy are procured through existing or new programs. It's a clarification to the underlying bill. I don't think anyone objects to that. Uh, Senator Grassley has an amendment, 1306, that he's well aware of that authorizes the Attorney General to appoint counsel to represent an unaccompanied alien child with serious, serious mental disabilities. I most certainly would support that. He and I have worked together on many pieces of child welfare legislation. There's no one opposing that amendment. Um, Johans 1345 requires CBO to report on revenues and costs generated by the bill and requires the DHS secretary to generally adjust fees under the bill to cover costs that are not fully offset. As the co-sponsors of this bill have said, this bill will not cost taxpayers any money. It is offset by fees. This amendment is simply clarifying that statement. It would be a good amendment. I think, you know, that is an example. And finally, two more, Senator Coates, 13. 72 requires a similar to Senator Grassley to consult on children coming through with mental disabilities to make sure that they have legal counsel. No one would object to that. And then finally, Senator Flake, 1472, requires the GAO to study use of non-federal roads by Customs and Border Protection. Now, these amendments are not striking lightning anywhere, not upsetting Western civilization. These amendments are perfecting amendments that we came here to legislate on behalf of our constituents because there are people or groups or entities in our state that are following the big bill and the big controversies of it, but some people are actually following the specifics and want to make suggestions to make the bill better. So people that are going to vote against the bill can still vote against it. People that can vote for it can still vote for it, but we can make the bill better. 
That is what we are here to do. Now, I'm going to uh, sit down, and uh, I'm not going to, I can't, under the, under the order, to uh, have any uh, uh, motions, but I will just bring it to the attention of the Senate that I'm going to submit this to the record, and if there are any objections to those that I've talked about, please let us know. Thank you, um, and I yield the floor. Madam President. Senator from Ohio. Madam President, I rise today to talk about a couple of those amendments that I hope will make it on the Landrieu list because I think they are entirely consistent with what she just talked about, which are amendments where there should not be any controversy, where we can come together as Republicans and Democrats and support them to improve uh, this underlying piece of legislation on immigration reform. Uh, I do think it's important for us to resolve this issue of an immigration reform system that is broken, the legal and illegal system. Uh, as you know, uh, Madam Chair, as I talked about it yesterday, I still have concerns about the legislation in a number of areas. One is on the internal enforcement of the legislation, particularly with regard to the workplace. The magnet of work, I think, can be strengthened through a stronger uh, and more comprehensive E-Verify system. And we plan to offer an amendment in that regard and working with both sides of the aisle on that. I also have concerns about federal benefits uh, going to non-citizens. I know Senator Hatch has been working diligently on that, as well as uh, Senator Rubio and others. And I'm hopeful that we'll be able to work something out there. Border security, of course, we've talked about a lot today. That's important, but it's not sufficient, in my view. Uh, and then finally, I, I want to say that I do have concerns about the way in which people adjust to legal status in terms of what crimes uh, that they have committed. And that's what I want to talk about today. Again, Senator Landrieu has talked about supporting a number of uncontested amendments that will improve the underlying bill. Uh, I think these couple of amendments I'm going to talk about today fit well into that category. They simply apply a uniform and fair standard to everybody. And I think that is, at a minimum, what we ought to be doing. If you're convicted of a felony crime, uh, there ought to be a fair standard applied, and, and you ought not to be able to attain a legal status. They would also ensure that dangerous criminals who prey on the most vulnerable among us are not given legal status under this legislation. Yesterday I talked in general terms about what these amendments would accomplish. One problem I identified is that in the underlying bill, it requires an applicant for legal status to have served at least one year in prison in order to make that person ineligible, regardless of the crime, and uh, even if the crime they committed was a felony. I think it's also important to understand the kinds of criminal convictions under the current bill before us that would not prevent someone from beginning this process that could end up having them become a citizen. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples here. And these are the kind of examples that we see on the nightly news that fill us with disgust, outrage. And they're not hypotheticals. These are real-world examples. A man convicted of felony child abuse for beating his children, ages six and eight, with a riding crop, shooting them with BB guns and bottle rockets, burning them with cigarettes. A woman convicted of aggravated child abuse for giving alcohol to an eight-pound, seven-week-old infant to the point that its blood alcohol level was more than four times the legal limit for an adult. A man convicted of domestic felony violence when he broke into the home of an ex-girlfriend, choked her, pulled out her hair, beat her to keep her from getting help. All of these criminals were convicted of felonies. None of them served the full year imprisonment required to be inadmissible under S-744, the underlying bill. So if somebody was convicted of these horrible crimes, they could still be admissible to go into legal status because they didn't serve that magic one year. Uh, by the way, this can result from a lot of different things. One is the disposition of the sentencing judge. Uh, one is a recommendation made by prosecutors, maybe for reasons that were valid, uh, to try to get more information out of these criminals. Uh, it could also be because of overcrowding in our state prisons, which unfortunately is endemic around this country. So, look, I think making decisions based on time served is not the right way to go. It means that two individuals convicted of the same crime of violence, in this case domestic violence, one serves one year in prison, the other is sentenced to six months, the first person is barred from citizenship, and the second would be eligible. It's unfair, it's illogical, it's not keeping with the spirit of the legislation before us that says we should treat all violent felons in the same manner. My very simple amendment would ensure those convicted of domestic violence, stalking, or child abuse who could have been sentenced to not less than one year imprisonment for the crime at the time of conviction is not eligible for citizenship. The second amendment ensures that crimes against children involving moral turpitude, things like child abuse, child neglect, contributing to the delinquency of a minor through sexual acts, are not subject to the discretionary authority of the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security and the immigration judges. This is with regard to removal, deportation, and also admissibility of an individual. 
Crimes involving moral turpitude look past the conviction and the elements of a crime because these acts are conclusively against our values as a people. This amendment, by the way, would continue the standards we've always had enshrined in our immigration system. For that reason, just like the previous amendment, I believe in a sense this is just a clarification that is necessary to make this underlying law work. A quirk in the bill before us would change that. It weakens the laws designed to protect our kids, and that's the kind of reform we don't need. Discretionary authority has its place. I acknowledge that. But there's no excuse for committing acts of violence against children, and those who would do so are not worthy of citizenship. But under the legislation as currently written, someone who commits a felony assault, say a man who gets in a bar fight with another guy, would be deported. But a father who goes home from that same bar and beats his children or hits his wife would not necessarily face the same consequences. I can't believe that that was intended in this legislation, or that anybody in this chamber would find that acceptable. Mr. President, I want to make sure this immigration bill only benefits those who are worthy of it. The bill is for the men and women who have come to this country to build a better life for themselves and for their families, not those who would abuse them. It's for those who are willing to work hard, not for those who have served hard time. It seeks to open the door to American citizenship for those who share our values of respecting and protecting human life, not those who would commit crimes against the most vulnerable among us. The debate on immigration reform has been long, and at some points it's been difficult. I saw that on the floor earlier today, and many of the amendments that have been offered have been highly contentious. Uh, again, I'll be offering some amendments on ensuring that there's proper enforcement of the, of the legislation uh, later in this process. But I would say that these amendments I'm talking about today, that we have offered, they're before the Senate, they're amendments 1389 and 1390, uh, these are amendments that shouldn't be contentious. They're only intended to protect our children and ensure that the creation of a path to citizenship does not leave the victims of domestic violence as second-class citizens. There'll be hard votes in days to come. This is not one of them. I urge my colleagues to support both of these amendments. I yield the floor, Madam Chair. Senator from Colorado. Recognition, and I want to assure my colleague from Utah through the chair that I will be brief. Um, and I appreciate very much the, the uh, Senator from Ohio's patient work on this bill. I wanted to come to the floor this afternoon uh, to talk about the agreement that we've reached with Senators Corker and Hoven that will significantly increase security measures taken at our borders. We spent a lot of time talking about this issue over the last months with some proposals that would have simply gone too far by sacrificing the path to, citizen to citizenship perhaps completely in some of these proposals. And I want to thank uh, Senator Corker and Senator Hoven, the other senators that have been involved in this discussion for uh, striking the balance in a different place and giving us a path to another bipartisan agreement that's required compromise, principled compromise on all sides throughout this process. We have always said, a number of us have said, that this bill is not the bill each of us would have written left to our own devices. But the nature of this place when it's working uh, is that it's a place where people make principled compromises and come together. I want to thank Chairman Leahy who's on the floor today for the process that he led in the Judi Judiciary Committee to get us here. There were over 300 amendments considered. There were 141, I think, amendments adopted by both Democrats and Republicans. This is the way Colorado expects the United States Senate to work. A state that's a third Democratic, a third Republican, and a third Independent, and doesn't care very much about what labels people put on each other or themselves, but would like the institutions in Washington to actually reflect their priorities and reflect the way they do business, which is by coming together and figuring out how to deal with principled disagreements. So while we've said this, this bill isn't the bill that, that I would have written alone, uh, it's a good bill. It's a bill that's gotten stronger uh, in the committee and stronger on the floor, and that's the way it's supposed to work. And people at home know that doing big things means that we're going to have to be willing to come together from time to time in, on compromise solutions. And that's what we're doing here. We're protecting the principles that the eight of us laid out when we started this process, which includes ensuring a pathway to citizenship that's real and attainable, in addition to preventing future illegal immigration through, among other measures, securing our borders. 
Our agreement had additional support for securing the border even after the improvements that we've seen over the last 10 years. But now what we have before us is what some have called a border surge plan that will significantly expand resources at the border beyond what is already in the bill. It will double the number of border agents, double the number of border agents, an agent, it's been estimated, every 1,000 feet on the border. It will significantly expand fencing. It will implement new technology and resources such as fixed towers, surveillance cameras, and aerial surveillance units. It will provide for full monitoring of our southern border. We've already dramatically increased security at the border. This bill will double the number of border agents on our southern border. And while these items will add more cost to the bill, we know that such costs are offset by fees and fines on visas throughout our bill. And yesterday's news from the Congressional Budget Office, the, the bill as written would achieve nearly $900 billion in deficit savings over the next 20 years. This fact, coupled with the gigantic steps we're already taking at the border, along with a growing coalition of support for fixing our broken immigration system, is leaving opponents with less and less to undercut the bill. The case is simply slipping away from maintaining the status quo that's holding back our economy, keeping us less secure, and tearing apart families. You know, at home, people actually think securing the border is a virtue. They support securing the border at home. And people at home think a pathway to citizenship that resolves the question for the 11 million people in this, working in this shadow economy, in this cash economy, is a virtue. People at home believe that both of those things would be positive. In Washington, somehow it becomes a trade. Border security for citizenship, depending on which side that you're on. And I just want to say how grateful I am to the other members of the Gang of Eight, particularly to Senator McCain and Senator Graham, Senator Rubio, Senator Flake, my Republican colleagues, and to Senator Hoven and Senator Corker for creating the opportunity for us to have a big bipartisan vote on this Senate floor next week to be able to show the American people that there's hope that we can finally resolve not just the issue for the 11 million, but we can also begin as a country to have the talents of, of people from all over the world that want to contribute to our economy, that want to build their businesses here. I want to thank them for legislating in such a constructive way and as we move forward to have the chance for each of us to vote, to reaffirm two essential principles uh, that make our country so special. One, that we're committed to the rule of law and the other, that we are a nation of immigrants. And with that, Madam Chair, I, or Madam President, I yield the floor and I thank uh, the Senator for Utah for his patience. Madam President. Senator from Utah. Madam President, I ask consent to set aside the pending amendment and call up amendment number 1207. Madam President, I object. Objection is heard. Madam President. Senator from Colorado. I, I didn't know that was the purpose of uh, the Senator uh, rising, um, so I will keep going on another topic. Does the set, through the chair, does the Senator from Utah want to speak? Yeah. Uh, uh, through the chair, uh, the Senator from Utah would like to speak. So through the chair, two sentences, uh, which is, uh, our farmers and ranchers in Colorado uh, have been suffering through the worst drought that we've had in a generation. And this is the third year in the row of that drought. We have passed a bipartisan farm bill twice on the floor of the United States Senate, uh, I think with over 70 votes. Uh, it's not perfect. There are things in it I would change. It's the only bipartisan deficit reduction, other than the immigration bill, that's been achieved by a committee in this Congress on either the, uh, in either the Senate side or the House side, the only one. We make important reforms to our conservation title. We end direct payments to producers. The Senate bill is not a perfect bill, but it is a good bill. And today, the House of Representatives voted their own bill down. And farmers and ranchers in Colorado who are working hard to try to support their families, 
to create a condition where they can leave their farms and ranchers to the next generation of Coloradans are left to scratch their heads once again why Washington can't get its work done. I urge the House of Representatives to pass the bipartisan Senate Farm Bill so that our farmers and ranchers can get the relief that they need. Thank you, Madam President. With that, I yield the floor. Well, Madam President, with the Senator, before I yield the floor, uh, yield for a question. Senator from Vermont. I'll yield. Madam President, um, I believe the Senator is aware of this, but I'd ask that he know that when we passed the Farm Bill last year by a huge bipartisan margin, and again this year, that on the Senate committee are several former chairs of that committee in both parties, as well as the former Secretary of Agriculture, and we came together as Republicans and Democrats to pass a bill that saved uh, 23 to 28 billion dollars. I, I believe the senator is aware of that. I, 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 through the chair, I am aware of that. I appreciate the senator from Vermont, the former chair of the committee and now the chair of the Judiciary Committee, reminding the chamber of that. The senator from Vermont has been here longer than I have been here. There is no, there is, it's just being honest about it. Uh, but I, I wonder sometimes what it would have been like to serve in this body when it didn't have a 10 percent approval rating. The chairman was here when uh, the United States Congress didn't have a 10 percent approval rating. I don't know why anybody in the world would want to work in a place that had that level of approval rating. Madam Chair, Madam President, I came down the floor once with a slide that, that tried to find other enterprises that had the kind of approval rating we have in this Congress. And it's really hard to do. The IRS had a 40 percent approval rating. There's an actress that had a 15 percent approval rating. 11 percent of the American people say they want the country to be a communist country. Uh, I don't, by the way, Madam President. I think Fidel Castro had a 5 or 6 percent approval rating. We have to start working together here. That's what the American people want. That's what the people in my state want. They know that we're not always going to agree on everything, but they expect us to actually get things done. And one of the things that we have in front of us, this immigration bill, is an excellent example of Republicans and Democrats coming together to do their work. And the chairman is, is exactly right. The senator from Vermont is exactly right. We have differences on the Agriculture Committee sometimes, but they're not partisan differences. They're not differences between Republicans and Democrats. They're regional differences. And we find a way to hash those out. And we were able to pass that bill on this floor with broad bipartisan support. That's what we should do with this immigration bill, and that's what the House of Representatives should do with our Senate Farm Bill. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President. Senator from Utah. Madam President, I certainly share the concern of my friend and colleague from Colorado and, and thank him for his clever remarks on that. We do, as an institution, have an alarmingly low approval rating. I've often said that um, we're slightly less popular in America than the Castro brothers and slightly more popular than the influenza virus, but the virus is gaining on us rapidly. There are many reasons for this. Uh, one of them, I think, has to do with the fact that we just too, control too many aspects of the lives of the American people. There's so much of what the American people do that is governed, even micromanaged, by the federal government and by what it does every single day. So much of their wealth has to go to pay their taxes to the federal government. So many of their communications are potentially susceptible to being monitored. Uh, so much of what they do is in one way or another restricted by the federal government. I'd like to discuss an amendment that I've proposed, amendment number 1207, that would address one of the many, many uh, implications of the fact that we have a federal government that is simply too big. And it deals specifically with the ownership of federal land. Now, in my state, the state of Utah, the federal government owns about two-thirds of the land. That's two-thirds of the land uh, that has to be managed by bureaucrats, uh, bureaucrats ultimately working out of Washington, D.C., uh, who, for the most part, don't tend to share the same values or the same interests in land development as people from my own state do. 
That's land that we can't tax and land that we therefore uh, can't access as a resource. It's land that because it can't be taxed, cannot um, provide tax revenue for local governments to fund fire departments, police services, and schools. It has other implications too when the federal government owns this much land. You know, it's significant that about 40% of the land along our border is owned by the federal government. And it's significant that along a lot of that stretch of border, federal agents uh, from the Bureau of, Cust uh, the, the, uh, Bureau of uh, Customs and Border Protection, or CBP, are not allowed to do their job. So even our own federal officers sometimes can't do that which they really need to do, that which they've sworn an oath to do, at least not very effectively. Uh, for the simple reason that this is federal land and that there are a whole host of environmental restrictions that often accompany the use of federal land or traversing on federal land of any kind. And again, this is foreign to many of my colleagues here, uh, who, many of whom come from states where there's very, very little federal land. It's significant that in every state in the Rocky Mountains or west of the Rocky Mountains, the federal government owns 15 percent or more of the land in those states. And in every state east of the Rocky Mountains, the federal government owns less than 15 percent of the land. And in many states, it's much, much less than that. In some cases, less than uh, one half of one percent. And so I don't expect all my colleagues to sympathize with this immediately, but I would hope that in time as they come to understand what we face in those states where there is this much land ownership, uh, that they'd be sympathetic to this amendment. So the idea of this amendment is that we've got a problem. We've got a problem when CBP agents can't adequately enforce the law, can't adequately enforce the border and protect it for national security purposes and for immigration purposes alike, simply because of the fact that the land's federally owned and environmental restrictions get in their way and interfere with their ability to do that. The net result of this is not environmental protection, because as we've seen, in many of these areas, because uh, coyotes and others who bring people illegally across the border are well aware of these restrictions. Uh, they'll make sure that illegal immigrants come across these very same tracts of land in order to get into the United States illegally. And they leave in their wake, uh, in some cases, a, a, a trail of destruction, or at least a trail of litter, uh, as they drop things along the way. This also, by the way, creates very dangerous conditions for many of these immigrants who are trying to cross very remote sections of land. Uh, and it makes it difficult not just for the agents, but also for the immigrants alike. It's not really good for anyone. So this amendment tries to change that. And this amendment would provide immediate access to land at the border for the purpose of maintaining or building roads, fences, uh, also driving patrol vehicles and for installing surveillance equipment. You know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, people are dying on the border uh, as, as a result of the fact that immigrants very often will cross these very remote sections of land. They run out of water, they run out of food, they run out of other, other supplies, they get lost. And it's, it's scary. This would happen less if we were adequately enforcing our border. And again, borderlands are littered with the trash left behind these illegally crossing illegal aliens. This has not gone, gone completely unnoticed in the past. In fact, this has been reported in the press. Just a few years ago, the Washington Post reported, it was on November 16, 2009, uh, uh, the following, quote, in a remarkably candid letter to members of Congress, Homeland Security Secretary Janet Napolitano said her department could have to delay pursuits of illegal immigrants while waiting for horses to be brought in so agents don't trample protected lands, and warns that illegal immigrants will increasingly make use of remote protected areas to avoid being caught. The documents also show that the Interior Department has charged the Homeland Security Department $10 million over the last two years as mitigation penalties to pay for damage to public lands that agencies say have been caused by Border Patrol agents chasing illegal immigrants. So look, uh, every one of us in this body that I'm aware of has been saying we need to secure the border. And that we do. I, I, I'm here to reiterate that very point. 
if we're serious about that, as we claim to be, then we have a certain obligation to make sure that our CBP agents and officers have the ability to enforce the law, that, that they're not fighting this battle with one hand or perhaps both hands tied behind their back, uh, that we're not ordering them to make bricks without straw. We've got to give, give them the ability to do their jobs and certainly not interfere with it. It's not just that we're placing a minor incidental burden on their ability to enforce the laws. We're talking here about 40 percent of the land along the southern border that is federally owned. So we're dealing with an awful lot of land and uh, everyone knows that if you enforce the border in some areas but make it impossible to enforce in others, you're going to drive the illegal immigration traffic toward those areas of the border where their enforcement is not ongoing. And so that's what my amendment does. Uh, this has been debated and discussed in the House of Representatives. My understanding is that in uh, prior legislation, the House of Representatives has even adopted uh, uh, this provision. And uh, I urge each and every one of my colleagues to take a close look at Amendment 1207, which I hope to call up in the near future. And uh, I hope we will pass this measure. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield the floor. Madam Chairman. Senator from Oklahoma. Uh, Madam Chairman, first let me thank the, my very good friend from, uh, from Iowa who uh, graciously allowed me to make a very short statement here. Uh, and I am concerned about this. Uh, several of us have amendments we've been trying to get up for a long period of time. I, quite frankly, I don't know what the current status of, this, uh, of the amendments and the bill uh, are right now, whether we're going to be getting to some votes sooner or later. I have no way of knowing, but I, I have one amendment that is, is one that I thought would be so acceptable that there wouldn't be any opposition to it. And let me just very, just very briefly tell you what it is. My amendment addresses the 2001 United States Supreme Court decision in uh, Zadias. Now, this, this is one where the court held, and we all remember this, the immigrants admitted to the United States then ordered removed, couldn't be detained for more than six months. Now, four years later, the Supreme Court came along and extended the decision to people here illegally as well. So that's what we're talking about right now. We're talking about illegals that come into this country. As a result of that, the, the Department of Justice and Homeland Security, they have no choice but to release thousands of criminal immigrants into our neighborhoods. The problem with these decisions is that the criminal uh, immigrants ordered to be removed can't be deported back to their country if that country refuses to accept them back. Now, let's stop and think about that because the, the case, I, I certainly wouldn't, uh, I couldn't criticize a country for not taking back a hardened criminal into their, into their country. And of course, that's the case that happens. Now, more importantly, these decisions have serious impact on public safety, as recent cases have illustrated. Six years ago, a Vietnamese immigrant was ordered deported after serving time in prison for armed robbery and assault. He was never removed because this Supreme Court decision handicapped the, our, our authorities. Our immigration officials couldn't deport him without the cooperation of the Vietnamese government, which they didn't get. The Vietnamese government said, we don't want this guy back. And his de deportation was never processed. Now, this same immigrant who is uh, Ben Tai Luke uh, is suspected of killing five people in a San Francisco home in March of 2012. The story of, uh, of, of Kian Wu puts this situation in perspective. Kian Wu felt a little safer after the man who had stalked her Short, uh, choked her, punched her, pointed a knife at her, and was locked up and ordered uh, removed from the, from the country. Well, she naturally felt better at that time because the guy was behind lock and key and then was going to be ordered back to his country. The man, Wan Chen, was a Chinese citizen who had illegally entered the United States and has been the case uh, of about 8,000 times in the last four years. Mr. Chen's home country refused to let its violent criminal return. So here's a guy who's a violent criminal. We were going to send him back to his country. His country didn't want him. 
So, handcuffed by the Supreme Court decision, immigration officials released Mr. Chen back into the community when they had no place else to send him. They, they released the guy. And as you can imagine, this story also does not have a happy ending because upon his release in 2010, Wang Chen murdered Qian Wu. Murdered her. Well, she, she knew, she suspected this was going to happen. And as you can see, this is a real problem with serious consequences, and there are others like these people out there. According to statistics provided by the Department of Homeland Security, there are, are many countries that are not cooperating or that take longer to repatriate their nationals. Countries like uh, Iran, Pakistan, China, Somalia, Liberia, these are all on that list. The Supreme Court and making their decisions said that Congress should clarify the law. So I have an amendment that clarifies the law it, uh, by creating a framework that allows immigration officials to detain dangerous criminals, uh, immigrants like uh, Ben Tai Lu and Wan Chen. Uh, specifically, immigrants can be detained beyond six months. This is what the amendment does. Immigrants can be detained beyond six months if they're under orders of removal but can't be uh, deported due to the country's unwillingness to accept them back into their country. And um, it, there are several conditions that have to be made, including if the release would threaten national security. Keep in mind now, we're talking about the determinations are made that they threaten national security, uh, threaten the safety of the community, and the alien either is an aggravated felon or has committed a crime of violence. Now, understand that the ACLU is opposed to this. This should make everyone excited about getting this thing passed. And, uh, and, and by the way, we're going to hear people say that this is, there, are, there are no conditions. There are a lot of safeties that are built, built into this. The secretary, for example, in order to keep someone past six months, will have to certify every six months that this is not indefinite and, and certify that the, the, the threat is still there. The alien still has access to our federal courts. And so, you know, only the conditions of being a threat to the safety of the community and must also have committed a crime of violence uh, or aggravated felonies. So, I can't imagine that anyone would be, would object to this uh, and would be uh, putting all these people in danger. And of course, we've already had some deaths. And I think it's very reasonable that we um, uh, go ahead and take care of some of these things that would be very, would, would be acceptable. And so for that reason, I would ask unanimous consent that amendment number 1203 be brought before us for its immediate consideration. Jackson is